Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you're all very welcome, uh, whether here in the room or uh, taking part through the live stream. Is that okay, Lorcan? Uh, um, uh, my name is Alex White. I'm Director General of the Institute here. Uh, as I say, everybody's very welcome. Um, I think we can all agree that the question of EU enlargement has sort of hurtled up the political agenda um, across across uh, the Union, um, most especially since the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, and has become a, a, a ever more important topic in that context. Um, and there is much debate and discussion um, about the, the various questions associated with enlargement, perhaps the challenges in some cases, in other cases, maybe obstacles, arguably, uh, uh, to accession, but also opportunities, um, also part of that discussion, part of that debate. And um, with eight candidate uh, countries and two applicant countries, um, many have also uh, argued on the need for reforms uh, in how the European Union operates uh, before there could be a 37 member state union. Um, in her address to us this afternoon, um, uh, we're delighted uh, to have Jessica Roswell, Minister for EU Affairs of Sweden. And the minister will give, I think, um, a timely survey of the Swedish government's view uh, on the topic of EU enlargement and overall generally the future of the European Union uh, at this time. Uh, Jessica Roswell is the Minister of EU Affairs and Nordic Cooperation in Sweden, having held that role since uh, 2022. She's been a member of the Swedish Parliament since 2010. Um, uh, prior to her current ministerial role, uh, Minister Roswell was chair of the Moderate Party in Uppsala County. She also served as a member of the advisory councils of the Swedish Agency for Work, Environment, Expertise, the Uppsala County Administration uh, Board, and the Swedish Consumer Agency. And I'm pleased to say that prior to entering politics, Ms. Roswell was a practicing lawyer for many years. Uh, here, here, exactly, yeah. There's a few of us left. Um, I want to note uh, the critical, indispensable support of the Department of Foreign Affairs um, for this talk and indeed for the series that it's part of. And in fact, it is, we're kind of engaged in a mini series this week on the question of enlargement because we have three talks in all in the course of the week. Um, Minister Roswell's talk, obviously, today, starting off the uh, discussion, as it were, or continuing the discussion, but starting it for us here this week. Uh, tomorrow, we're delighted to uh, say that we'll be hosting um, Peter Burke, Minister Peter Burke, um, who has responsibility for European affairs, uh, to provide an Irish perspective uh, on the question. And then on Thursday, we're going to be joined by Lawrence Meredith, who's director in DG Near in the Commission, to give uh, the Commission's perspective on this uh, uh, important uh, topic. Um, so, as I say, first of all, uh, we're going to have Minister Roswell. Uh, she's going to speak to us about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a QA. and a um, and you can take part in that, either in the room. It's most easily by simply putting up your hand. Um, and uh, if you're watching us online, you can use the Q&A function uh, on your uh, laptop or computer. Um, you'll see that there, and you're well familiar with it this time. A reminder that the presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. If you want to use Twitter or X or whatever you like to call it uh, now, please do so. The handle is at IIEA. And as I mentioned, we're also live streaming, live streaming this afternoon's discussion. So once again, warm welcome to everybody, including those of you tuning in on YouTube. And it's my great pleasure now to hand over and give the floor uh, to Minister Jessica Roswell for her presentation. You're very welcome. So thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you for the introduction. Yes, uh, some, in some rooms the, uh, it's good to be a lawyer, <laughs> not always. Uh, but thank you very much for having me to, to have this speech today on this topic that is very, very often on, on my mind at the moment, enlargement and the future of EU. Let me start with a quote. Our constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring neighboring states. We are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves. Its administrations favors the many instead of the few. This is why it's called a democracy. These sentences are from one of the most famous speeches in history, Pericles' funeral oration. 
This speech was held more than 2,400 years ago, but parts of it could be had written today. Because the struggle for democracy, for a system of government that, government that favors the many instead of the few, is not ancient history. It's an ongoing battle. And I do think that the battle is the right, right choice of word. Because battles are literally what the people of Ukraine are going through to preserve their democracy. The Ukrainians are fighting despite cruel war, war crimes, despite ecological destruction, and despite nuclear threats. Despite all that, Ukraine is still ruled from Kiev and not from Moscow. Ukraine needs to win this war, but they also need to win the peace. And that is where enlargement, EU enlargement, comes in. Because enlargement is about making sure that Europeans can live in peace and prosperity. It's about spreading Europeans, European values, dem democracy, rule of law, freedom, equality, human dignity, and human right rights across our nation. And it's about making sure that free democratic Europe stretches all the way from Dublin to Dubrovnik and to Kyiv. And with the war raging on, uh, on EU's doorstep, enlargement, is, enlargement is, is not abstract anymore. Now it's a concrete and urgent issue. Now it's not a question of if it will happen, but how. And today I would like to provide you some of the Swedish perspective on the questions that the future enlargement raise for the EU. And perhaps I will ask, also ask a few questions myself along the way, since I don't have all the yet the answers, and I will try to have the survey, but also cross some questions. First, let me answer the question, why enlargement? Why do we need to make the EU ready for future with more member states? I think there is an obvious answer to this question. It's about making Europe safe for democracy. Today, we live in a world of great power competition. China is, rep is repressive at home and assertive abroad. And I don't need to repeat myself about Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. And for a smaller country like Ireland and Sweden, EU membership is extremely valuable in this era of great power of, of, of comp competition. With almost 450 million citizens, the EU has become a force to be reckoned with, a, with, with, with to be reckoned on with on the world stage. And with 24, 27 member states combined, it matters if you have trade agreement with us and if we impose sanctions against you. And having more countries to join a democratic integrated Europe can also make us all safer and richer. Just take a country like Estonia, which is one of Sweden's closest neighbors. And 30 years ago, uh, there were Russian troops based in Estonia. Now, there are world leading tech companies based in Estonia instead. That's the difference that European integration makes. And when we speak about enlargement, let's remind, our, remind ourselves that one of the best examples of successful enlargement is Ireland. This year, Ireland celebrated 50, celebrates 50 years as a member state, and I was part, did, taking part in the European Parliament this spring and during the Swedish presidency when we celebrated there. And 50 years ago, uh, in that time, Ireland has become from gone from one of the poorest members to the to, to the second second richest in terms of GDP per capita. Many will seek advice from you on how to success in Europe, and they should. Thanks to previous round of enlargement, countries like Ireland and Sweden have benefited uh, greatly. Our economies have been able to grow thanks to the expansion of the single market, and we have more democratic, friendly countries in our neighborhood. And with the bigger EU, we will have also been able to expand our influence in the world. And if we do this right, I am convinced that future enlargement have, can have similar effects. But of course, doing it right will be hard. It will require reforms that in the candidate countries, and it will also require reforms on how the EU uh, itself works. And these reforms 
have to be anchored and accepted by our citizens. So let us be honest to, with our citizens about the work that we need to do to turn, e turn a bigger EU also to a better EU. And this brings me to my second question, how do we enlarge? And this was a question I wanted to raise during the Swedish presidency this spring. So therefore I invited my colleagues in the informal general affairs council in Uppsala to, to discuss three main issues. How will, e, will enlargement affect our policies? How will it affect our budget? And how will it affect our institutions? These dis discussions are still ongoing, but I would like to share with you a few key observations so far. First, we cannot have enlargement without proper protection of the rule of law. This is not just because we want the EU to become a democratic role model on the world stage, but also because our cooperation rests on mutual trust. Trust is trust that our common rules are respected all across the union. Trust that our citizens and our companies will be treated fairly by courts in other member states. Trust that our common resources, our taxpayers' money, will be spent, well spent, and not end up in wrong pockets. And if we cannot trust these things, the foundation of our cooperation will fall apart. And this is why the rule of law was one of Sweden's priorities during the, Sweden, the presidency this spring. Among other things, we held hearings with both Poland and Hungary under Article 7, and we also organized a rule of law symposium that provided recommendation for the EU institutions and future presidency. We did this because going forward, we need to do two things at the same time. We need to hold candidate countries to a high standard while also getting our own house in order. So this is why Sweden support using conditionality and clear demands on member states that they respect the rule of law to access to EU funds. And I'm sure that the rule of law will continue to play a key role in the enlargement debate. In fact, I think that this is essential to gain public acceptance for a bigger reformed EU. Second, in the discussion on EU reforms to make us ready for enlargement, we have to focus on what is politically uh, possible. And this is why Sweden believes that we should focus on our efforts uh, on policy reforms, not to uh, not treaty changes. We all know that we have a big chance on how uh, we have to do big ch changes of how the EU works. For example, Ukraine's uh, farmland cover an area that greater than Italy, and therefore we will have to reform the common agriculture uh, policy. This will of course, have difficulties, difficult, this will be uh, difficult enough in a lot of countries. Thus, we don't need an, to add a treaty change process on top of that. Uh, we might risk to sow seeds for a political backlash, like, like the one we saw in Ireland before the Lisbon Treaty was ratified, when a majority voted no in the first referendum. And the second reason why we don't need the treaty changes is that the Lisbon Treaty is enlargement proof. For example, it is already possible to make more decisions quali by qualified majority. And Sweden is open to do so in a limited number of areas within the common foreign and security policy when it comes to sanctions, human rights and civilian missions. And moving to QMV or qualified majority voting in these areas would also allow us to EU to speak with one vote. And this is especially important in times of democratic backsliding worldwide. In, our, in other areas, uh, however, such as taxes, Sweden believes that the unanimity remains important to protect national, in, national interests, especially for smaller member states. And frankly, Unanimity, unanimity has stopped, hasn't stopped the EU from taking quick and decisive actions in the few in the last few years. Despite Brexit, despite the pandemic, and despite the war in Ukraine, the EU has still managed to be unite. So when we talk about how we should make decisions in the future, I think that we also should keep those experiences in mind. Third. What should the end goal of enlargement and the EU's internal reforms be? 
On this question, the view from Stockholm is that we should strive forward and uh, forward a united Euro Europe with respect for the rule of law at its, at its heart. Sweden is open to the idea of gradual integration for candidate countries to make sure that they receive some benefits from European integration on the road towards full EU and membership. But the end goal should still be full membership. Countries that live up to the EU's high democracy and rule of law standards should not remain in some concentric circle or waiting room. If they are ready to join the EU, the EU has to be ready to let them in. In this geopolitical situation, we cannot afford to have to let countries that are that are able to and willing to remain uh, on the outside. If we don't offer them partnership, China and Russia would be able to have will, will be happy to do to do so. If a candidate country sees this, if the country if the candidate country sees this momentum, so must we. Finally, um, if uh, a big EU has to be firm when it comes to our fundamental values, perhaps we need more freedom and flexibility when it comes to some of our own regulations. Harmonizing our rules and standards is often a good thing. For instance, having the same product standards for, for goods and for, uh, is a good thing if you want to have a single market. However, other things are more difficult to draft, draft detailed laws about in a diverse union. Just to take one example, the local environment looks very different in northern Sweden than in, say, Cyprus. Therefore, we should focus more on, a res on the results and allow for a greater freedom and flexibility on how these results are achieved. Moreover, we need a better Need, we need better regulation because the EU is facing a competitiveness uh, crisis. For many years, the EU has been losing grounds to the major economies such as the US and China. And one of the most common complaints, it's not, <laughs> um, one of the most common complaints from companies in the EU these days are that regulatory burden is too big. So when we enlarge, we have to keep this in mind too. The regulatory burden should not expand just because the EU does. Instead, a bigger EU must build on the strength that we already have. To, and to tackle future challenges such as enlargement, we need to boost our competitiveness in a general and the single market, and in the single market in particular. To conclude, I think that the war in Ukraine has shown us how strongly people actually want to live in a free democratic Europe. If it wasn't already clear at the Maidan protest in Kiev today, 10 years ago, it is definitely clear now. As the discussions on enlargement and the future of the EU moves on, I think we should remember that, um, that and not lose the sight of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that as much as we will argue about internal reforms, such as whether we should have more QMV or not, and an EU membership is very attractive. It offers access to the biggest single market in the world, to what will be the world's first climate neutral group of countries, and to the union that has actually kept the peace between member states for more than 70 years. As long as we stick to our principles, strive to keep the EU's unity and allow member states some freedom and flexibility to achieve our common goals, I believe that we can make future enlargement a success. That way we can extend government that favors the many instead of the few, even to more, to more Europeans. So thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to answer your questions. Thank you very much, um, Minister, for that. And uh, I, I noticed uh, well quite a few things in, in what you had to say, but one or two of them I think will um, be met with some 
uh, certainly uh, relief and I'm sure um, agreement in Dublin, in, in political circles anyway in Dublin, what you said about treaty change and also what you said um, about um, decisions on taxation, that you, you didn't see the basis for, for that changing. Um, uh, I wonder, though, that uh, you, what how you evaluate or how you think about the Franco-German position and the paper that was published, um, uh, um, into a paper on institutional reform published earlier this year, I think in September. I don't think there's much there in relation to necessarily treaty change being required, but some quite radical proposals in there in respect of uh, institutional change. Uh, do you think that those proposals have value or what's, what's, what's your general approach or what's Sweden's general approach to what's set out there? No, uh, I, I think that is one good example on how to put um, uh, interest in ideas and have the, the on the table. So when we had this informal General Affairs Council meeting in, in Uppsala and Stockholm during the Swedish presidency, it was one first step to have these discussions, as I said. But I think that the, the, the German Franco paper also put into this discussion. Uh, and also from the Swedish um, Institute of European Studies, we have uh, um, a book from called Fit for 35, which also is mm. very interesting reading if you want to have this discussion. So I think, of course, uh, we have not, the Swedish government has not taken pro, uh, if you say yes or no to different suggestions in, in the paper. But mm. I think there are things that are really interesting. Example, for example, the, the suggestions about the rule of law and how we can Im implement these things. Uh, so I think all of these papers and discussions and panels are very important when we are now in this the movement of future of, of enlargement. So, so both yes and no in, in the context of, of uh, suggestions, because they also don't, all of them don't have the necessary, to, speaks on the necessity, necessity to have treaty changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm interested if there are any questions or observations in the room or indeed online. I'd be delighted to um, to entertain them. So, um, Kieran Amaro, at the back. Hold on for the microphone. And if you're asking a question or making an observation, tell us who you are, even though we know who you might just mention. Do you have Kieran any Amaro, designation? Kieran Amaro, retired lawyer and <laughs> member of the Institute. And I was very interested in the remarks made by the Minister regarding the Lisbon Treaty. And I completely agree it is a very flexible treaty and it has left the EU in a very strong position to go forward. For example, if you look at the last four years at the amount of legislation that the Commission has proposed and has been adopted by the Council and Parliament, uh, week by week we're seeing the green transition and all kinds of legislation going through by qualified majority voting. I'm always amused and somewhat um, as, uh, uh, cynical when I see, I look at a, at a commission proposal to see the legal base for the proposal and it's surprise, surprise, invariably by qualified majority voting. It's a single market measure and so on, even though it doesn't appear to have anything much to do with the single market. So I agree with you that the Lisbon Treaty is very flexible. But there's one treaty area that does worry me, which is if you have 10 more member states and you have 10 more commissioners, um, you end up with 37 commissioners. And I just wonder at what point do you devalue the commissionership of each member state by having so many? Do you in, in, in informally turn the commission into a two-tier inner sanctum and outer sanctum or what happens? And I just think that might be the core problem going forward. We have to find some way to deal with the commission size. Mm. Well, very good. Thank you. Um, good question. I think it's legitimate, legitimate, sorry, that's a difficult word to say in Swedish and English, obviously. It's very good questions about how big should the commission be? How big, how many um, people should be in the European Parliament? How should the Court of Justice look like? Um, all of these questions are uh, important to discuss. I avoid the word that I obviously not cannot pronounce. Uh, but um, I think from the Swedish perspective, no, for so far, I think it's important to have one commissioner per state. Mm. 
small country like Sweden, this is important. And I think it's also important for the EU uh, or legitimacy to have uh, representatives in all countries. But I understand that this will be a difficulty in the future. So uh, I'm not ready to see the solution yet. But so I, you, you raise a very important question, but I thought it's also balanced, of course, uh, on, on the legitimacy from, from both sides. So, so far, I think it's very important for us to have our own com uh, commissioner. Uh, but of course, how will it function? Uh, I don't have all the answers yet. So as I said, mm. it's a lot of questions, but that is one great right question that we need to raise. And that's was we, when we had this discussion in Sweden, we, we had the policy discussions, the budgetary quest questions, but also how will our institutions work? And you, you lift the commission. So that's one of the parts. Mm. Interesting, yes. So. Uh, Dilla Marshall, a researcher here at the IIEA. Um, my question is related to, you mentioned the rejection of the Lisbon Treaty here in Ireland and the nervousness about treaty change. And I just want to get your thoughts on how we can bring the public with us on institutional change, but also on enlargement as uh, en enlargement to new member states now requires a referendum in France. So I'm just wondering how across Europe we can bring uh, governments can bring the public along mm. in these big changes. That is the question that I think a lot of. I don't in that I don't have the answers also, but uh, that's one question that I raise along with my colleagues often. Uh, I raise it when I meet the Swedish Parliament, uh, my colleagues in the government in Sweden, uh, because this is really we have to have the pub the, the people on board on this enlargement. Uh, so far, uh, and I was in uh, on the uh, in, in the panel last week when there were figures out on how the support within the European Union is from from citizens on enlargement, which is high. I think there were fifty two percent or fifty three something, uh, and I think actually in Sweden it's higher uh, because we have always been in favor of enlargement, um, uh, and we I think also after the uh, full scale invasion of Ukraine, I think. When I meet people, uh, mostly in Sweden, uh, everybody see the reason that when it comes to enlargement today, it's the geopolitical situation, the security issue is the main target. Uh, so I think that is one thing is that it's been obvious now. But also, because I also speak spoke about the, the economical reason why this is important. Uh, this is something that we have to speak about about a lot what well, as often as possible so my I, I i will i hope that the the election to european parliament next year will be one opportunity to speak about the future eu with our citizens uh, i will absolutely do so and i hope that the, a lot of other eu ministers and all ministers and all parties around the european union will, will have this on the top agenda when we when we meet we meet the voters uh, but this is a really important question uh, that I think a lot about. Isn't it one of the, I suppose, challenges that are kind of coming back to a point that Kieran O'Mara made about the size of the commission and these become complex institutional questions and how you know would it would would a new would a would a, a smaller commission be more effective and so on and what about countries then who wouldn't end up having a voice at the table as it were, that that is how inevitably that issue will be discussed in a referendum, for example, or even in parliaments where enlargement, if one looks at the sort of the potential negative side of this debate in public opinion is if we, if any individual country, Ireland, Sweden, any country would be likely to lose clout or lose effectiveness or, you know, it's that it's, its impact would be less. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of headline point that does grab attention, I think, in the broader public. So I remember certainly that was the case here. Um, in in one or other, either the more recent referendum or the one just before it, I think the more recent one, where people said, "Well, we're losing our commissioner." So no matter how it's it's um, presented, even if there is a clever way of having, you know, commissioners who are not necessarily in the College of Commissioners all the time, it still will be seen as a loss of a voice or mm -hmm. loss or a dim or a diminution of the voice. No, exactly, and that is why I think uh, so far I think it's important to have one commissioner per, per member state. But of course, uh, it will constitute maybe other uh, bureaucratic uh, discussions. Uh, but uh, 
I think when it comes to public um, citizens wanting to do enlargement, I think one of the things that is important that we um, have efficiency uh, mm -hmm. and we have uh, the money spent on the right things and we don't see it in wrong pockets, as I said. These questions are also very, very important for people. Uh, mm -hmm. Gentleman there. Yes, yep, yourself, yep. Paul Keane is my name. Um, I, I am a practicing lawyer, but I'm also, for full disclosure, I'm the Honorary Consul General of Sweden. Um, uh, you've mentioned elsewhere, and you've touched on it here today, uh, the risks of member states um, acting in a manner against the fundamental values that underlie the EU. And I think one of the concerns is that we have a further enlargement, um, that there could be the possibility of some states acting in concert uh, who might um, not, not uh, comply with the fundamental values. Um, and how do we protect ourselves uh, against that? Uh, obviously, the, 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 perhaps uh, through qualified voting, but are there other measures that you have in mind uh, that might be an effective sanction um, uh, and uh, protection against that risk? Against, uh, in turn, amongst member states? Yeah, member states who basically don't behave themselves and who uh, don't uh, respect the, the rule of law. No, um, I think, yes, as I said, we, we have seen a backsliding across the world, but also within the um, within the EU on this. And that is why I think uh, we have had, the, the EU has a lot of tools. Uh, we have the Article 7, we have the dialogue, uh, but we also now have the, the me conditionality mechanism. Uh, and uh, I think these are tools that we need to use. Uh, and uh, I think here is also Sweden and Ireland very like-minded on how can we uh, exchange our views because these are really important values that we cannot, um, that has to be in the core, especially when it comes to enlargement. And that is why I push so very hard on these questions, especially when it comes to enlargement on these 10 countries that are now uh, uh, candidate or uh, applicants uh, that we this is something that when we talk about merit base this is really the first step when it comes to merit base mm -hmm. um i think that one of the things in the german uh, german french paper is on how to uh, move forward on different uh, parts of, of the rule of law internally uh, I have not the answers yet, but I think there are interesting suggestions in that paper that you can might see and use. But also, uh, I, I think the conditionality mechanism is really one thing that we need to also stick to, which has only been in force for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Barry, and then yeah. Thanks very much, Minister, and, and welcome to Dublin again. Um, I was really struck by some of the things that you said. So you spoke about in, in Estonia 30 years ago, there was Russian troops, and now we have some of the leading tech firms in the world. And I have a question about what you said also about the countries seeking partnership from the EU, that if, I think, to to hopefully not misquote you, you said that if we don't offer them partnership, China and, Russian, China and Russia might. So my question for you, it kind of builds on what you said to Alex and to Dylan. It's about the questions or the, the risks of non-enlargement from a geopolitical perspective. So thinking of citizens in Uppsala or in Dublin, not talking about the important questions of do you have a commissioner or voting rights in the council, in terms of their security, the economy and society, what are the costs to them of non-enlargements if the EU stays the same size? Thanks, Minister. Thank, thank you, very relevant question. And uh, I think that the, my point is, because I think this is true, uh, what I said, of course, and you quoted me correctly. Uh, and I think, uh, and that is a thing that you have to have in mind when you discuss the enlargement, what is the cost of the, not doing this? But my point in, in having this first discussion in Uppsala was that EU cannot hinder or stand in the way for enlargement. We have, we cannot, you know, we cannot uh, end up in, in long discussions on are we ready or not? Have the, do we have enough uh, room for 36 commissioners or not? The question is, we need to do this. Uh, otherwise, uh, someone else will do it. Uh, 
so absolutely, uh, and the uh, the cost will be um, severe, I suppose, and that is also why I, all, I want to mention again and again and again: Ukraine is not fighting for themselves only; they are, but they are also fighting for our security, and they need to win the peace mm. uh, long term uh, because it's our our democracy that we are also fighting for. So absolutely, the cost is is there. Uh, so. Uh, so my point is absolutely don't let us not focus only on internal question. This is mm. important. Also, we need to do our own homework. And I feel uh, when I speak with my colleagues and also on the the the, the leaders um, uh, level, the discussion is ongoing on how to make EU ready for enlargement, which is really good. And uh, my other point is the, to the the candidate countries, the momentum is now. You have to also do the reforms. But uh, the EU cannot hinder or stop uh, due to our right. own, that we have not done the homework. Sure. Thank you very much, Minister John O'Brennan. I'm a professor who specializes in enlargement policy. You were admirably clear in everything you said, so I thank you for that, especially about treaty reform. Some of the current conversation about enlargement actually is very similar to the 1990s and the early 2000s. And Sweden played an incredibly positive role in facilitating enlargement at that time. But my question to you is about the blockages in the council in particular, because these have become more and more problematic over time. We have individual member states objecting to particular candidate states for particular reasons. And it means that the candidate state just cannot make progress. North Macedonia, having solved the problem with Greece, then was confronted with this other problem by the Bulgarian objections, which are all about identity, culture, and history and have no place, in my view, in these negotiations. It's not difficult to see Croatia having problems, for example, with some of the Western Balkan states at some point in the future. So I would just wonder about the thinking in Sweden about this, about how we overcome those kinds of obstacles in the council and what kind of measures might be taken that might facilitate genuine breakthroughs mm. where they're necessary. Thanks. Uh... I do a lot of thinking about that also, and I, I'm afraid I don't have the perfect answer because these are really difficult questions. And you've seen the also uh, the evaluation in these discussions on uh, in the council uh, on different uh, matters. Now, I think um, I I see some problems on the road, absolutely, but overall. I would say that all member states, when we meet ministers, every, well, if, I, if I recall the min, men meeting in, in Uppsala in the spring, all we had all the ministers there, maybe not all ministers, but all countries were was represented. And I would say that everybody, con, what we were um, had the same opinion that enlargement is not about if, it's about how. So this is good. <laughs> but then I, I'm not pretending this will not be easy. Uh, we need to, I'm, I'm very clear on that, but still, I, I think that we have the same goal and the reason for that I've been, what I've been talking about. Uh, so, but when it comes to different, uh, also a reflection on, on when you speak about North Macedonia and, and other countries in the Western Balkans, I also reflected, I was in Slovenia when uh, on the BLED conference. I think it's called Blood Conference, uh, and uh, and Jean Michel was there speaking, uh, and also he mentioned this uh, 30, 30, 2030. Anyway, he also mentioned that we cannot take into the EU conflicts that are in different regions. Uh, so this is also an aspect on 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 the other call. So I think it's you asked me also almost two questions at the same time. So the candidate countries need to do their reforms, we cannot take conflicts into the EU, and the parallel processes within the EU, we, the Council, we need to also make these important decisions. I'm positive that we will do it, and we'll have the possibility and the capacity and the, the will to do it, but of course I see some very difficult discussions on uh, uh, that will be raised during the process, absolutely. 
I suppose just picking up on that, Valerie Hughes, who's an IAA member, um, asks a kind of almost uh, anticipating this question of regional differences. I mean, you mentioned obviously you've been concentrating on rule of law question, but occasionally the one manifests as the other uh, because Va Valerie says in the context of the rule of law, um, Western Balkans and EU enlargement, um, would you care to comment on the Serbian president Vucic's openly irredentist policies as Valerie describes them towards Bosnia, Kosovo and Montenegro? I suppose the question almost illustrates the point that a regional conflict or a regional difference may, may, may not be seen that solely that way by everybody. It may also be seen in the context of broader philosophical or your rule of law questions. Mm. No, exactly. And that is one of the points that you cannot have these, mm. you cannot bring those conflicts uh, into the EU. Need, this needs to be handled before. Mm. No, but I think um, during the Swedish presidency, I uh, I visit, uh, I, me and the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Sweden, Tobias Bilstrom, visit all the countries uh, on Western Balkans. Uh, both to give our support, uh, and Sweden has for a long time been supportive in different ways in, in all countries to to do the reforms in in, uh, in different ways, but also to say, but you need to do your homework uh, because this is uh, um, a, a merit based process, and that is very important for both Sweden and Ireland, and and a lot of other countries, of course. Uh, so. Um, I I, re I know that there is conflicts and um, different member states, different kind, of, different states have different uh, uh, difficulties in mm. this, so to speak. So absolutely linked to that. Um, Maureen Junker Kenny is a professor at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, asks, or I suppose it's a comment or a question, whichever way you like to treat it. Ukraine may not become a member state if Hungary and Slovakia oppose it. Uh, due to their ties with Russia and the additional Hungarian interest in the Hungarian-speaking minority in Ukraine, what means could the EU use to mitigate this? <laughs> kind of same, similar sort of question. No, uh, no absolutely. Uh, and I know that the Ukraine's, Ukrainians, because I met uh, during the Swedish presidency again, that we had a lot of Ukrainian ministers on, on board on the informal meetings and, and have a lot of discussions. So I had a lot of the discussions with uh, my counterparts like uh, mm. and, um, Olga Stefanishina, and I know that there is a lot of discussion uh, bilateral between uh, Ukraine and Hungary on the minority question. Um, so what can EU do? Yeah, but because this is a process that um, is is following uh, kind of not a schedule, but it's a, it's ordered or it's. A, Everybody knows the process, so yeah. to speak. Uh, and uh, now they, Ukraine had these seven um, reforms that they need to do. And then the commission's report came two weeks ago on starting negotiations, if and when in March, then they have fulfilled this. So I think the commission and the EU is doing the, not maybe the mitigation, but the, the demands that we ask, the EU asks, so you have to do this. And when it comes to minorities is one example that we have this um, criteria for, for all new member states. Mm. Um, and this is the decision on all these questions are unanimity. Mm. Uh, we all know this and we need to move forward. But as I said to earlier, I think the goal is we need, we know we need to, we, we want this enlargement. Uh, and the process might be, take some time, absolutely, but it's important. And the, I feel that we know we have the same goal. Mm -hmm. Question here at the front. Minister, I'm Fergal McNamara. I co-chair the Energy and Climate Group here at the Institute. And uh, thank you very much for your talk. I, I was interested in your remark about harmonization and the need for it, or I think you put it that uh, maybe results-based outcomes were just as good as harmonization. And but, but my day job is in the energy markets and electricity markets, and we were very particular about harmonization even standardization in our particular field. And I suppose the more harmonization, the bigger the acquis, the harder the accession negotiations. So I just wondered if you could share some more of your thoughts on uh, how that plays out or what, what could be done different or um, how, how it should be organized. Thank you. 
So my example, when I say this, is because it comes a little bit, maybe also come to the the public, uh, the, the citizens uh, having the citizens aboard, uh, on board. Um, uh, one of the discussions that we have all uh, very often in Sweden is about forestry, uh, and if I make it simple, I can say like, like um, that maybe we. Swedes don't think that the EU always understands how we think about forestry. Uh, so this has been a discussion uh, ongoing, and that is one of the examples that I, I took up when I think we need a regulation that is more on, focused on a goal rather than detailed, because we have different um, possibilities and uh, the situation looks very different. So, so and but on the other hand, I have, of course understand and I know and I want to have that a lot of re regulations and uh, this also have to be is the same in the whole union. So it's a, it's a double <laughs> double uh, things to talk about, of course. But when it comes to um, the energy, no, but that, that's the example I would say that this is one of the things. Then then it comes to better regulation. I always and I meet a lot of companies that. And they don't only complain about EU, they also complain of the government in Sweden, no matter what color it is, maybe, because it's too much heavy regulation. So that is something that we have to have in mind. And during the Swedish presidency, we put competitiveness high on the agenda. And one of the points that we pointed out was that we have to have better regulation and a lesser burden and a less uh, rapporteur, rapporteur, reporting. Um, so... Sometimes, well, EU is very good on regulating, which is sometimes good because we are uh, frontline when it comes to making the climate goals, for example. But sometimes we need to also have, that's why I use the word better regulation, not more regulation. Sometimes that means less regulation, but sometimes it just means better regulation. Uh, then when it comes to the acquis, when it comes to enlargement, uh, I visit, I have an example from Albania, uh, which I visited also when uh, the Swedish um, support, when uh, we, have, we are engaged in one of the uh, reform work when it comes to making, uh, reaching the, the climate goals. Uh, so this is something that we, because I think that Sweden and other countries in, uh, also are very good in the green transition and our companies are, so we, we export our way of doing the green transition and, and that was one thing that eu member states can help to support candidate countries to also that we all can reach the climate goals so to speak mm -hmm. yep and then and then at the back here first and then at the back Thank you, Minister Myra Cross, a member of the Institute. We've been talking about enlargement uh, up to about 37, but I just wanted to ask you about your close neighbour, Norway, uh, who will be uh, very much an outlier in terms of Europe, uh, uh, if uh, the European Union, uh, if, if we do achieve the enlargement. Do you feel that this will put any pressure on Norway, the, this major extension, uh, to rethink uh, their application? And just a second one, uh, we're seeing a lot of destabilization by Russia on the Finnish border. Would you expect that the Nordic countries would find uh, themselves under pressure uh, and indeed any of the other countries with Russia uh, increasing um, activity to try to destabilize any uh, enlargement activity? Thank mm. you. So yes, I'm a minister of EU affairs, but also minister of Nordic cooperation. Mm, uh, yes. So the question is very, uh, <laughs> very good. No, no but uh, I, I of course uh, never ever um, comment other countries' decisions. But uh, this is uh, not a secret. Uh, so sometimes when I meet with my colleagues in Norway, uh, also it doesn't matter what color the, the politician is. I always ask, uh, uh, when will you come <laughs> to be a member? When you, will you have your application to a member states in the European Union? Um, and uh, well, that's up to them, but I don't see any movement at the moment. And now there is, uh, we have also Iceland. No. So, uh, but on the other hand, I would say this, in the Nord, when it comes to the Nordic countries, we have a very good cooperation and we work very closely also when it comes to EU uh, laws and how to implement them also in all these countries, uh, even they are not mem members. 
so um, um, well, it's up to them, of course. But of course, I would gladly have them in the EU <laughs> uh, and also ISAP. Um, when it comes to the the what we have seen this last week um, on the, the, uh, the migrants um, uh, outside the Finnish border. Of course, we follow it closely. We are in close contact with our uh, Finnish, the Finnish government, and and see we have seen uh, similar movements in Poland for uh, one and a two years ago. Uh, 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 so it's worrying, uh, and we will uh, support um, Finland with whatever we can do, of course. But so we we follow it closely. Hmm. Um, absolutely. It's question at the back. I'm a member of the Institute. Uh, I want to raise a question about popular understanding of what the European project is all about. And that's in the context of another part of uh, Pericles' speech, where I think he was quoted as saying that um, although we're, a few are only able to originate a policy, we can all understand it. In the current way we consider Europe. We only talk about Europe once every five years when there are European elections. However, the European Parliament Constitutional Affairs Committee, which is basically an institution, looks at institutions at hearings in 2012, there was a presentation by a, um, uh, a then Swiss MP, uh, Dr. Andy Gross, who at the time was uh, chairman of the Social Democratic Group uh, in the Council of Europe. And he said that in Switzerland, we get to talk about what it means to be Swiss four times a year. That's because of the way they have constitutional, they have referendums four times a year, referendums on either local issues, uh, cantonal issues, or national issues. Um, surely that is something that the EU must now consider if we, the ordinary citizens who are not insiders or incumbents, not bureaucrats or politicians, are to try to develop a common understanding of what it means to be Europe and change that understanding as, as we change. And bear in mind that Switzerland is a country with two major um, religious divides, four languages, and a big divide on, on how they cook potatoes. Mm. So, um, if I start with, if I if I understood that correctly, uh, like that we discuss EU issues only every five years when it comes to European uh, elections, in practice, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, no, 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 absolutely. <laughs> okay, no, I try to tell everybody, of course, and I, I, I think that I. I speak from for a lot of ministers of EU affairs uh, that we think that I, I agree that we speak too little about EU issues. Uh, my prime minister last week when he did the EU declaration in speech in parliament uh, had uh, said several times that EU politics is uh, national politics. Uh, and I, of course, totally agree. And I have repeated this since then, and I and it's been also around in the Swedish media because I think this is the issue. We all, all politicians, should speak about EU politics as it is uh, national politics because it is, and we know we all have the figures on on uh, on the agenda in the municipalities council that I don't know how these figures now is like 50, 60, 80 percent that is actually have uh, started in the EU, in some EU policy. So I'm, I try actually to do my part of the job, uh, uh, of course, and I, um, I spend a lot of time and, um, on schools, on uh, in different discussions, because I think this is a problem that we don't discuss it more. Absolutely. And I, I'm afraid also that you, you could, you could argue and the next, if you have a you know, say again that, even when it comes to European uh, elect European Parliament elections, they tend to be national elections, uh, mm. even so. So this is also a sad story. So I really hope that this election can focus on EU issues like enlargement. I maybe be a little bit naive, but I will do my best and do my part of this, and also the parliamentarians. Um, uh, 
Uh, I'm not in favor of a, a referendum, uh, not either on the national level. I don't think that that is the way that we do policy. In Sweden, we have representative democracy, and I think it's something that I defend every day. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to have a bigger discussions on EU affair questions. And that is also a question that I try, I try to speak with the journalists in Sweden, um, because sometimes I feel that people that I meet think that EU matters is difficult, um, which it of course is if we only talk about files that are far away, but if we actually break them down to what it is, uh, it's it is not difficult so I think and it's important for all of us so uh, I understand what you say uh, but I, I I hope that we can uh, move to that we all discuss the EU questions more uh, what it really because it's really important for us mm. I mean it remains a challenge though doesn't it always that um, certainly 10 years ago here or 10 or 10 years ago during the crisis I remember one time Herm, Herman von Rompuy kind of making the opposite point and say instead of EU yeah. politics being national, he said something along the lines of that national parliaments were essentially now EU institutions. <laughs> now, uh, that was at the reverse point and much more problematic, particularly in the context in which it was said, historic, you know, in terms of the crisis that was happening and that, that the parliaments, the EU, I was present when he said it, that the, the, the parliaments were institutions of the European Union. Now, that's a that's it. I'm 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 slightly misquoting him, but not I think violently misquoting him. It was something like that, uh, and I suppose that then just gives does still you know it, it recalls that whole debate about democracy and so-called um, democratic um, deficits and so on. That's just a constant challenge, I suppose. Mm. But you, you've you've addressed that. Yeah, a question here. Thanks very much, Minister. My name is Brian Kavanagh. Maggie Tat. Uh, we are positioning. Europe is a moral and democratic uh, opposition to, to Russia. And I get that. My concern is the ambiguity on many member states around particularly the issue of immigration. And the sense that some, from some perspective, Europe is looking like a fortress Europe rather than empowering Europe. I really enjoyed your speech on rule of law, but with so many xenophobes and influential state governments, how does to use your term, how does Europe clean up its own act in terms of ensuring that rural law and behaviour all of so we're talking about Hungary here, essentially, Slovakia and others. That's the first question. The second question says shaping ideas and policy. How do we reach out to civil society, not the people in this room, like your colleague said about insiders, because I suspect that commitment to Europe is very thin and wide. We need to be deepened equal as our commitment to national parliaments. So how is Europe helping civil society in the new emerging candidate countries as well as holding the line on our existing countries. Thank you. Mm. So uh, the first question was about fortress and not migration. No, no. yeah. Um, I think that um, one, well, uh, during uh, the migration question is of course a very it's a top it's on the agenda i i met with peter burke who is coming to visit here mm -hmm. tomorrow he, mm -hmm. and and we uh, discussed that migration is on the european council uh, agenda every time uh, at least since uh, uh, my government come into office mm -hmm. um, because it is a question uh, that is important uh, and from sweden's we have for us it's it's really important we have had a very high number of migrants, and we have not we have not been successful when it comes to integration. Uh, so, coming to a conclusion on the migration pact during the Swedish presidency on the in the council was a great achievement from us, mm. for our point of view, and we we surely work hard and now during the Spanish and the Belgian presidency to reach an agreement with the European Parliament on that. Uh, because it is uh, important for the European Union. Uh, when it comes to how can we live up to the rule of law, as you said, within the Union, and I, th I, I tried to answer a little bit earlier, because I think the, the Union has these different tools. Uh, and of course, you can criticize some of them, like Article 7, does have it really have effect? 
I think in one way it has, uh, because we have I've been attending the, the the General Affairs Council for one year now, and I think the discussions is is good, and that I think that it's moving forward in in these countries. Uh, forward when I mean uh, doing um, uh, reforms to to answer the Article Seven, but of course, at some end, some point, you have to discuss what will what will be the next step, and that is why one thing that I I think that this German French paper has some ideas, and also we have put forward in new uh, tools like the uh, conditionality mechanism, which is important. Uh, so of course. As I said, EU need to also uh, take these questions really serious because EU is built on values and we need to have the trust amongst us between member states. So this is really, really important, not only because of uh, the, us people, but also for our companies and uh, our single market to function. So these are, this is essential, of course. Uh, so I don't have all the answers, but I think you are on to something very important. Then you had another question that I, I forgot now because I didn't write it out. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. One, uh, it'll pr probably be the, the penultimate question because I have one from Dan O'Brien here also. Thank you very much, Minister. My name is Francis Jacobs, member of the Institute. Um, you mentioned several times the um, Franco-German paper, and obviously it's a really important contribution. And yet about a year and a half ago, there was a conference on the future of Europe, which made a number of recommendations, involved lots of citizens, national parliaments, and yet its recommendations seem to have disappeared completely. I, I just like your view on that. Mm -hmm. And my second question, you did mention in the context of enlargement, the importance of looking at the budget. Um, we've been stuck for so long with a very small EU budget, obviously minuscule compared to national budgets. Don't you think that enlargement um, poses for question, should there be a substantially larger budget than there is at present for the EU? And before you answer that, that's exactly Dan O'Brien, who's the chief economist of the IAEA, He's, he heard what you said as well about national vetoes on tax issues and wondered, does that also mean that Sweden favours maintaining the EU budget at its current level of around 1%? What you said about yeah, the, the national veto question, does that mean that you, you, you favour maintaining the 1% the um, MFF? Yeah, so now I wrote down both questions, so I don't <laughs> forget. So let me start with, the, yes, I mentioned the Franco-German paper because you asked me about it, but I also mentioned it's a lot of other papers coming out. Uh, I, I think one will come out uh, this today, tomorrow, and the Swedish Institute had, had this Fit for 35 paper uh, for a month ago or something. So it's a lot of uh, good thinking uh, around, which is really, I think, very helpful and good. Uh, yes, the Conference on Future of Europe was uh, uh, had a, a lot of discussions, a lot of um, uh, suggestions, but and uh, some a lot of them was has been taken care of within the Council, and uh, and some of them are also still discussing uh, ongoing discussions in the European Parliament. Uh, from a Swedish perspective, and this is also the previous government, and also including my government, is that we were quite. Uh, as I just said, another question. We, uh, the uh, it was a lot of citizens included, but not that many actually was included. Uh, if you are Swedish citizens, they don't know about the Conference of Future of Europe. I would say so. That doesn't mean it was not important question raised. But still, I think we really need to work on having the people, the, the citizens on board, and that is not the the answer is not the conference of future of Europe. Mm. Uh, I think that's another homework that we all need to do together, to be honest. Uh, but uh, as I recall, and maybe I'm not exactly right with the figures, but I think like eighty percent of the the suggestions were taken care of within the council in different councils, of course. Um, so, uh, still, uh, when it comes to budget question, this will be one of the difficult questions. Uh, and I will not give a, correct, a straight answer on how much money will the next budget uh, be. Uh, but I think we have argued for a modernized budget for a long time in Sweden. Uh, and what is modernized, of course, you can discuss that. But I think this is an important question that will absolutely be necessary to discuss 
because or due to enlargement. As I said, Ukraine with its the large country, which uh, uh, that would probably need to have difficulties for a lot of countries when it comes to the uh, COP. Uh, mm. I yeah, cap. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, and uh, will it have substantial? Will it increase? Will the budget increase? I don't know, but I think uh, if you ask Sweden and Swedes, we don't want to raise the EU budget, uh, so we need to have a more much. We need to use well. How do we spend the money? But of course, enlargement will have effect on all of us. I I realize that. So this is, and I will. I think that it's important to not. Uh, I need we need to speak about this. This is difficult, and how can we do it? Don't don't shy away. This is important questions, um, and I'm not afraid to have the discussion. But I don't have the answer, so it's easy at the moment, maybe. Well, that's what we do here. We foster discussion. We don't necessarily always get to the answers. So thank you very much, um, Minister Jessica Roswell, for being with us this afternoon. Um, and for you, first of all, for your presentation, for um, responding to so many questions and for your insights and observations. Um, I, I think that enlargement is going to be a big preoccupation between now and the elections um, next summer and beyond, obviously. Um, probably for the first time, really the focus is coming back. That kind of debate for, for the first time in 20 years is the last big sort of series of accessions. So it's a big question and you've addressed this afternoon um, in, in a very insightful way. So um, our warm thanks uh, for, for being here and thank you all for your attendance, either in person or otherwise, and for your questions. And thank you again in particular to our colleagues in the Department of Foreign Affairs for their close uh, and continuing support uh, for this series. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.